if Ellie did bite Corey Allen? What if she did? What then? That night, Ellie changed into her nicest pajamas, lit a candle, and poured herself a glass of Cabernet. Then she uncapped a pen, opened her favorite notebook, and turned to a fresh page. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. <laughs> One, it is wrong. Two, I could get in trouble. She nibbled on the tip of her pen, then added two subsidiary points. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. One, it is wrong. Two, I could get in trouble. A, I could get fired. B, I could get arrested or fined. Ellie thought, if it meant that I could bite Corey, I would not mind getting fired. For the past year and a half, she'd spent most of her lunch hour, most days on her phone, swiping through job postings on wanster.com. She was ready for a new position and felt perfectly well qualified for one. However, finding a new job after quitting your old one was not the same as finding a new job after you'd been fired from your old job for biting. Would it be impossible to get a new job in those circumstances or merely very difficult? It was hard to know. Ellie sipped her wine and turned her attention to B, I could get arrested or fined. Well, that was certainly a possibility. But the truth was that if a woman bit a man in an office environment, there would be a strong assumption that the man had done something to deserve it. <laughs> if, for example, she went up to Corey and bit him in full view of everyone at Monday morning meeting, and then later, when they asked her why she'd done it, she answered sexual gratification, then yes, she'd probably be arrested. But if instead she bit Corey, Corey in private, say in the coffee room, and when they asked her why she'd done it, she said, he tried to touch me inappropriately, or even so as not to mar his reputation. He came up behind me and scared me. I bit him instinctively. I'm so sorry. Then people would probably give her the benefit of the doubt. When you got right down to it, as a young white woman without a criminal record, Ellie probably had at least one get out of jail free card. As long as she spun some semi-reasonable story, she would be believed. In fact, Ellie thought as she stretched out her legs and refilled her glass of wine, there was another possibility for how all well this could play out. What if she went up to Corey in private and bit him, and the experience was so bizarre that he didn't tell anyone about it because he had trouble <coughs> believing it himself? Imagine, it's late in the afternoon, past five, dark already. The office is empty. Everyone but Corey and Ellie has gone home. Corey is loading paper into the Xerox machine when Ellie enters the room. She stands behind him, inappropriately close. He thinks he knows what is coming. He stiffens, preparing to politely reject her, not because he has standards for workplace propriety, but because he's already hooking up with Rachel in HR. Ellie, he begins apologetically as she grabs his forearm and lifts it to her mouth. Corey's lovely face contorts, first in shock, then pain. Stop it, Ellie, he cries out, but no one hears him. The tendons of his arm roll and snap beneath Ellie's jaws. Finally, Corey gathers his wits enough to shove Ellie away. She stumbles backwards, lands against the stacks of copy paper and slides to the ground. Corey stares at her in horror, clutching his bleeding arm. He's waiting for her explanation, but she gives him none. Instead, she stands up calmly, straightens her skirt, and wipes the blood from her mouth before she leaves the room. What does Corey do? Of course, he could run straight to HR and say, Ellie bit me, but after all, it was an office, not a preschool. <laughs> Everything about the conversation would be ridiculous. Ellie, did you bite Corey, they would ask. And Ellie would raise her eyebrows and say, uh, no, what a weird question. If the HR people tried to push and said, Ellie, these are serious allegations, all Ellie would have to say was, yeah, seriously insane. Of course I did not bite the office manager and I don't know why he's saying that I did. Really, the odds were high that Corey wouldn't say anything at all. He would stay in the copy room for a while, contemplating the situation. And then the next day, he'd decide that the easiest thing to do would be to pretend it hadn't happened. He'd show up to work in a long sleeve shirt to cover the ugly bruise on his arm, the little half moon where she'd marked him with her teeth. And then part of Corey Allen's brain would be reserved for keeping track of where exactly Ellie was. She'd catch him looking at her in meetings. And when they were at office parties together, he'd continually be moving, trying to keep as far as possible away from her in a way, it'd be like they were always dancing, even if he never spoke to her again. Months later, when no one else was watching, she'd grin and snap her jaws at him, 
and he turned ghost pale and hurried from the room. He would remember her for the rest of his life. They'd be joined by the glistening strands of his fear. Later that night, the sweat drying on her body, her legs tangled in the sheets, Ellie forced herself to go back out to the living room and get her notebook. Fantasies were fantasies, but it was important to keep at least one foot in the realm of the real. She got back into bed and opened the notebook and rewrote her list. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. One, it is wrong. Two, it is wrong. Three, it is wrong. Four, it is wrong. Thank you. The story doesn't end there. <laughs> That's not the end of it. I was um, thinking the last few days in, in thinking of how to start this conversation. Now, how do I start um, a conversation with you without starting by talking about cat person? You can talk about cat person if you want. But you read us another story yes. or a piece of another story. And that's a good way in because this shows a lot more. This shows something very funny also. Oh, thank you. Can you hear all, all hear me, by the way? Is that good? Okay. Um, yeah, I hope so. I hope that people think it's funny. I always worry when I'm writing that I'm the only twisted person who thinks that my stories are funny. And so it's nice to get some kind of confirmation that other people agree with me. Yeah, so, so. It's, it's nice to read it out loud yeah. and, and hear the reaction. Yeah, uh. that's fun. I think it's the case with a lot of your stories in this book that they're funny. Yeah, and the truth is, I think that at points, Cat Person is also kind of funny. It's just that that's a piece of the story that got lost a little in the larger yeah, a lot got lost. Yeah, I mean, you know, it got introduced to a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, people had a million conversations about it in a good way. But yeah, um, in the sort of like broader cultural space, I don't think the humor yeah. was a huge part of it. But I think if people um, read this book and, and the different stories, because they're very different, yeah. um, they might, humoristic or funny isn't the first thing they would say. <laughs> no, I mean, the thing about them is that they are dark. They would and, say dark, yes. Yes, and I think that some people for whom darkness is, that, so for some people, the darkness is so much that that's what they'll see. And then I think if you kind of have a taste for darkness or if you maybe are curious about it, then also there's humor and also there's, you know, commentary on social issues, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, first they're dark and that's the truth. What is that, a taste for darkness? I mean, I always think of it for me, it's my taste in literature and, and in culture. I've always been a reader who's drawn to more intense stories, either psychologically intense, emotionally intense, or like plot-wise intense. You know, I, I was a big horror movie fan growing up. I still am. I think um, for me, fiction and is a way of, of exploring the parts of your maybe your psyche, your your heart that you can't necessarily indulge in in day-to-day -day life, like potentially your desire to bite your coworkers. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't have space in your ordinary day. And so it's part of the reason that I'm hungry for, for fiction and movies that will do that. And I think certainly there are purely realist stories that I love. I occasionally write them. Cat Person was fairly realist, but um, my my sort of heart lies with kind of the extremes that, that yeah. people end up in and how they act. So it's the, the hidden things you want to reveal them? Yeah, I think that's even an even better way of putting it, actually, is that like I'm, I like to sort of feel like I'm penetrating into the heart of something. The heart of darkness. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Because the book is dedicated to, it says, for my mother who taught me to love what scares me. Yeah, um, so that has a few different meanings. Um, my mom is a horror fan. Like she, I used to steal Stephen King novels and Dean mm -hmm. Koontz novels off of her shelf when I was way too young and scare myself with them. And um, so I do feel like I, I got my, I, I, I've had the taste for this stuff young and I got it honestly. Um, but I think it also is a kind of like way, one of the reasons that you can be drawn to stories that scare you or stories that make you uncomfortable um, is because it's a way to kind of teach yourself how to be brave, to like practice looking directly at the things that scare you. And I feel like my mom and my family in general like did believe in that, did believe and like if you're afraid of something that's telling you that you need to know more about it, you need to push yourself into it rather than stepping back. So is the writing, this might be a personal question, but is it also about conquering fear then? 
definitely, definitely a lot of times when I start a story, I am, something's bothering me in my own life. It's like I'm angry or upset or I'm frustrated or I just can't stop thinking about something that I, I think of it kind of as like an itch. It's like, oh, something I can't like quite wrap my mind around There's it. There's a lot of itching. There in the is, yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that discomfort often I will try and sort of think through and feel through with the story. And almost none of the stories are about the thing that in my real life is causing me a problem. Those are such much more minor things. But the story somehow like will pull that feeling out and magnify it or let me distort it until it feels strange or in some way like take it out of here and I put it on there and then it's like I don't quite carry it around with me in the same way anymore. Is a short story a good, a good genre to do that? Because, um, well, if you, if you say... Um, I, I wanna, I wanna conquer the fear or, or work through it. Yeah. Um, something's gotta give. Also, in a, in a very short time, something's gotta happen. I just heard you read. Uh, um, it's it's boring. It's quiet, and then <laughs> yeah, exactly. Somebody bites somebody right. else, and, and and the world is less dull. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really love that on like a much more sort of technical level. Mm -hmm. I love that ramping up and crashing down feeling. I think one of the reasons that I love horror so much and I love, I'm a huge fan of just genre in all its forms and like obviously you can run into cliches, things can get stale, but at its best, a genre story has like just the bones of a really good story. Like the beats are so clear and you need to hit them. And if the author is doing it right, the reader is just like on this ride that is so intense. And I think the short story can do that because it doesn't need to let up. In a novel, truly, and I'm wrestling with that now, you have to, you can't just keep a reader, I don't think, like ugh, for 200 pages. They need a breather, they need time. And a short story can be just a bolt of like pure feeling and then hopefully other things too. I can feel your love for it. Why are, we, why yeah. are you writing a novel? I love I love novels though. Okay. I always actually thought I would read a novel or write a novel before I I have read a novel. I've read many of them actually. Um, yeah, couple. Um, no, I uh, always thought I would write a novel before I wrote a short story collection, um, but that's not how yeah. fate ended well, up. You said okay, you you want to um, capture the attention of the reader, yeah. and you is that something you're aware of while writing? I want to carry capture first. I want to capture my own and attention like the most often that my when my stories stall out they stall out because I'm bored because I've set something up and I'm just like I don't care I don't care anymore and I've actually I used to wrestle with that a lot I used to feel like it was my job to kind of like bully myself into you know finishing every story that I started but now I don't think so I think that if I'm bored my readers are certainly going to be bored there's no reason to sort of like treat a story as like something we're all getting through for our own good. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There should be something in it that feels enticing. And I think sometimes that's plot and other times, and like what's going to happen. But I think other times it is humor. It's like character. You know, there's a lot of things that can like entice a reader in. But I think I do always, especially when I'm editing, you know, you write a first draft, but then a lot of editing is thinking, okay, well, what are people going to like, Do I need this here? What is this doing? Is it necessary? Am I just being self-indulgent, you know? And so then you do think about like, I think of it as like creating an experience that I have lived and that I'm trying to share with other people. Like it's a ride. That's the build up. Yeah. yeah. Because when I hear you talking now, I hear an author that's, that, that thinks that, um, well, plot is very important for you. I do love plot. I do. I think because yeah. I think maybe a short story without a plot can be interesting too. Of course, yeah. of course. But I have never been able to. Well, you know, it's funny. The collection spans like five or six years of my, me writing, yeah. and the earlier stories I think are more structured around the traditional dramatic, like um, horror esque plots. And later, there's one story that's the mo one of the most recent is The Good Guy, um, okay. that is a novella, and that entirely takes place almost in a flashback in a guy's head. And so very little actually happens. Objectively, some things happen. But I do think that I still wanted that feeling of tension. I wanted that feeling of you being moved toward through the story. And sometimes I think of it as like, Or was the scaffolding that taught me how to build a story and now I like sort of understand it a little more intuitively so I can still do it even if I'm not following the script if that makes sense yeah are you saying now that not everybody read the whole book 
Oh, yeah. You will afterwards. Absolutely, every one of them. The good guy is a is a, a longer story. So you're saying that that is m one of the more recent things yeah. you've read. Does that mean the writing is changing? I think. I mean, because it's very different. It is different. I mean, it, but it's not a hundred percent. Like Biter was also a relatively recent story, and mm -hmm. that story goes into some very weird spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so I would not say I'm moving from being like a genre writer to being a realist. I just think my repertoire of tools has expanded and the amount of things I'm comfortable doing has grown. And so I think that story, in part because it's longer, but also because it's more recent, shows more of those things, shows some of the like harder skills. Whereas like, I, but at the same time, I do think there's something very pure about a story like Bad Boy or a story like even Biter, where like, I'm not ashamed of my genre roots, you know, where really it's just like, boom, you? boom, boom, boom. You know, it's a, it's a joy to write. And I, they're the stories I love. It's a read. funny thing you say that. I'm not ashamed of yeah. my genre. Because is, do you think the, the genres, the genres you're describing, are they appreciated enough as literary genres? I don't think so at all. I mean, I, that's, you know, it's one of those things like, sure. Like, I, I like to have two drinks and be with my friends who all read books and be like, horror is the great unappreciated genre of literature. And I mean by that, not just that the horror stories are brilliant, but that many stories that we recognize as canonical are fundamentally horror stories. Okay, why is that? Um, I mean, because I think the scary story is just like the origin of a lot of storytelling, that that feeling is where so much storytelling begins. And if you think about writers like who are getting acclaim now, like just Shirley Jackson or Joyce Carol Oates, or even like, um, I mean, who would be another good example? Um, yeah, no, totally. Like someone would say Ed Edgar Allan Poe, it, it, like we, they're, they're horror stories, but like they're, they get to a certain level of respectability and then they're like put in an anthology and people forget that there actually are like murders and monsters and haunted houses in them. Yeah. Is that something that bothers you that people don't appreciate? Honestly, them? not that. But like, well, let's not talk about people. Right? Yeah. Critics don't know enough, maybe? Maybe. I mean, I think I don't, you can't, it's fun to me to make a like argument. I was, you know, so I did, I did a PhD in English before I started writing fiction. So I spent a lot of time on the other side of the divide. You read some novels. I read a couple novels on my way to getting that endless PhD. Um, and so I feel like for me, the idea that like it's your job to go in there swinging in defense of your favorite yeah. genre is like kind of pleasurable. Like it bothers me in the way that when I want to win an argument, it bothers me, but it doesn't bother me in a deeper way because I feel like people read what they want to read and they love what they want to love. Let's talk about the, the, the darkness uh, some more because it's a very, it's an in your face darkness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not uh, one that's, it's not the uncanny. It's not, it's not a, a, it's something that's creeping under your skin, although there's a lot uh, creeping under the skin yeah. in the novel, but in the, in the book. Um, but it's, it's very upfront. Sometimes yeah. it's already there in the first sentence. Yeah, totally. Um, what, or yes, that is true. Maybe I might, <laughs> um, I might read an excerpt. Yeah, because yeah, sure. That gives us an idea. I won't read too long. No, no, I'm excited. You're better at it. I thought maybe you can. Yeah, sure, but what is it? Um, well, page 13 or page 99? Let's let's start by page 99. Okay. It's just one sentence. Yeah. And that's how a story starts. And oh, then, is you know, a good guy? That's the good guy, yeah. yeah. Are you going to read it or am I? Go ahead. Okay. You no, you should to. have to read it. You pulled it out. You should have to read this. By the it. time he was uh, 35, the only way Ted could get hard and remain so for the duration of sexual intercourse was to pretend that his dick was a knife and the woman he was fucking was stabbing herself with it. That is true. That's a that sentence is that I wrote and gave to my own mother to read. <laughs> How could I? That is dark and that is in your face. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about sex later. Okay. But, um, <laughs> no, no. But then, you know, here comes trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that story, that's dark. But it's funny because like... That's Why did you let me read that? I don't know. You brought it up. I don't even read it. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I mean, I think that sentence... So in, I think of, I, do you want me to talk about that story in particular or just the darkness of that sentence? Well, the, the, the fact that it's so, that the darkness is so uh, overt. Yeah. So with this story though, in particular, it's funny, the, the darkness is overt in all of the stories, but I think it's overt in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like this story opens with that sentence, which is grotesque. And yet 
like we were just saying, very little actually happens in that story that's like on a genre peak, right? It's just this guy having some feelings and going on some bad dates. And so for me, one of the challenges of the story, and I feel like I'm always playing games a little bit with this, is like you open with that sentence. It's a grotesque sentence and you're horrified by that person. And the challenge for me of the story is partly to be like, can you start here and then get somewhere where you're like, oh, but maybe actually... Of course, I don't understand having that fantasy, but maybe I kind of understand why he does. Like, you start here and you go here. Whereas, like, some of the other stories start incredibly mundane, and then they go up and up and up and up and up until you're here. And I think all of it is a really careful balance because it is true that different people have different thresholds and some people will read that story and be like, no, thank you, and close the book. Um, but I think the goal is always to keep people in the space where they're unsettled, it's dark, but they also want to keep reading. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it to get the readers unsettled? I don't, so for me, I as a reader, I'm hungry to be, hungry to be unsettled. And I do think it's really important to consider the difference between sort of like voluntary discomfort and not voluntary discomfort. Like I think sometimes people read that, I feel like sometimes people will react to dark things and be like, oh, you did this just to shock me or make me upset. That's the opposite of what I would do. Because like when you're upset, you can close the book and there's nothing I can do about it. Shocking right? is not what you're in. Right, about. no, because it's like, if you're shocked, that's over, it's done. The goal for me is to give people the experience that I also want when I'm reading, which is to feel uncomfortable, but in a productive way, in a way that's like, maybe making me look inward, maybe just making me feel like this, but also to keep turning cages and feel at the end, like we've gone through something that was, yeah, maybe uncomfortable, scary, but like more roller coaster scary or dramatic movie scary mm. than like, here's this horrible thing, deal with it way. Like that's never, that just seems like such a reductive way to think about writing. It's like, oh, I'll shock you and then walk away. Yeah, that and wouldn't be interesting. No, it. and it would be so self like, it would be so just counterproductive, right? And with this guy, this good guy, <laughs> you've met this good guy in one sentence. He's really good. Uh, <laughs> we're with the, the sex part. Yeah. Because, of course, you mentioned your mom. Um, uh, let's talk about your mom. Yeah, sure. No, no, no. no. But um, there's a lot of problematic sex. Yeah, definitely. In the book. In your literary work, I haven't met an un problematic yeah is there no i mean one time <laughs> in this I'm book thinking, yeah maybe, maybe there's yeah uh, yeah two young girls maybe like before things really start mm -hmm. yeah there's yeah. a nice feeling there but yeah that's no, it. totally yeah um all the sex in the book is really dark a nice feeling yeah mm -hmm. it's a lovely lovely basement mm -hmm. um, fun. um but no it's true um i read a review of my <laughs> it was before the book even came out actually it was like i had written two and a half stories and the yeah. woman was like or two of my stories were out in the world and the woman on the basis of those was like one wonders if Kristen Rupenian even believes in the existence of good sex <laughs> and I was like excuse me you know um because the book is the book the stories are the I stories know. I don't want to know yeah. about your sex no life. no totally not at all but just like I just yeah. sex is, a, is, a, is an, an interesting vehicle of course yeah. to what you just talked about yeah. you know let the fear out let the yeah. let everything out that's hidden right and because I think in this book in particular the subject the true subject of it is isn't sex although there is a lot of sex it's in it power. it's power yeah. exactly and so I think all of the relationships even the non-sexual ones in the book are characterized by really asymmetric relationships of power and so the sex that comes into the book mm -hmm. then unsurprisingly is shaped by those imbalances is it about uh, biting or being bitten? Yeah, yeah, partly, yeah. Why is power so interesting? I mean, I think power is, I mean, that might not be an answerable question. Like, I just, to me, it's intrinsically one of the most fascinating subjects. The way that people who have power try and preserve it or inflict their will on other people, but also just as much when people are powerless, how they strain to get some kind of power or to, like, move out of, of the space where they, they don't have control. I think I'm particularly interested in, I don't know, I mean, I think for me, I'm, that's especially where I'm interested in is like those spaces where you don't think of yourself as powerless or you don't want to see powerlessness. And so instead you're telling yourself stories about power. I think that stories like 
and the stories that we tell ourselves is also like a theme that I care about a lot. And so where that comes in, could you elaborate yeah, on that? I sure. Know. Yeah. So just like, it's probably easier to talk about it in terms of like a in one individual story. Okay. Um, Let's take cat person. Yeah, let's do it. That's this is the one that, that makes the most sense. We're getting there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so in cat person, right, we have a main character, Margo, um, and I don't know, presumably many of you have read it, but it's a story about two people, um, Margo, who's 20, and, and Robert, who's in his mid-30s, and they meet in person, and they, they flirt online for a while, and then they go on a single kind of extended, very bad date. And the, the movement of the story is that as Margot sort of, she, she's on the date and she's sort of slowly realizing that this guy is not the guy for her. Um, and yet she keeps moving it forward um, to the point where kind of at the, the sort of peak of the story, um, she thinks, oh, like they're about to have sex. And she thinks, oh, I don't want to do this, but she does it anyway. And the story is sort of like interested in, in her decision up until that point and then the ramifications afterwards. And I think for me, one of the things that the story is interested in is the way that Margot, in over the course of the date, she's thinking really hard about Robert. She's thinking about who he is and what he thinks about her. And he sort of she's sort of coming up with all these theories. She's like, oh, you know he is rude, maybe that means he's a jerk, or maybe it means he's intimidated by me and I just need to be nicer to him and then he'll be nice. And it's sort of, it's a series of stories. The story starts when they first meet and she feels romantically attracted to him and she tells herself a kind of romance. And then as the date moves along and he um, just sort of acts he doesn't, he's not, he is not the person that she wants him to be in the story. You're being so yeah. careful in how, yeah. you, how you talk about it. Yeah, yeah. no, and I don't mean to ramble on, but I, I think that she, she basically comes up against the limits of the stories. Like she's continually talking herself into continuing with the date to the point until she's at the point where she has to decide to have, where she's deciding yeah. to have sex. And then it's like, she can't get herself out of the story that she's been telling. And she ends up in this other like darker place person we've just read the biter yeah also tells herself a story exactly exactly and i think it's not inherently bad right like she's fantasizing 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 in biter um and she has stories about what it would be like to bite someone but she has other stories it's wrong to do it i could get in trouble like da, da, da. like they're all just competing and the question of the story in some ways is which of her stories will win out <clears throat> But in literature, that's double interesting because yeah. we as a reader, exactly. we get to hear those stories Definitely. that somebody's telling Definitely. him or herself. Yeah, yeah. And it's been really interesting when hearing people's reactions to my stories. Like, they also tell themselves stories about my stories and about me and what the stories mean, you know? And sometimes people read a story and they take one of the stories that the characters is telling themselves for the truth, you know? And it's like, maybe, you know, but also maybe there's other things going on. But that's... Then we're really talking about technical stuff like the point of view. Yeah, Something exactly. uh, we readers often forget. Yeah. We tend to forget. That means it's it's been written in an excellent way. Well, yeah. <laughs> but it also means yeah that we, we, we tend to forget that we're only reading one part of the story. Exactly. And I hope that one of the things the stories do, especially all taken together, mm -hmm. is like occasionally sort of poke up and remind you that you're... Cause, and how could you not, right? When you're in the... POV of someone who opens by thinking, I want to imagine this girl's imagining me stabbing her with a knife or whatever, then you know you're in a really limited perspective. And the interesting thing is to kind of try and follow it and see where it's telling the truth and where maybe it isn't. Yeah. But now you said um, all the stories together. Uh -huh. But there was cat purse. It's true. So we just had this one perspective, we as a reader. Yeah. And that was, wasn't that part of the, the thing why it everybody was so angry because some people just forgot that they just got one part of the story. Yeah, I mean... We it's, talk about, like, the real people. How yeah. strange is that? Which, But it's strange, but great, right? Like, I think that's the goal always, is to write a story, unless I'm going to do that sort of hello moment, but you want the POV to disappear until the moment where you're bumped up against it, right? Um, and I think that people... I don't know. I mean, I, th I think 
people had a lot of feelings about that story that I'm still doing my best to process. I think that you're still at it. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's like for every, that's one of the things that's really weird is that for everybody else, it was a weekend, you know, where everybody talked about cat person and then it moved on. But for me, it was my whole life, you know, like everything changed. And like, I, it's, it was a complicated thing. And I, yeah, let's, let's just, (laughs) <laughs> it was Sorry. one weekend because it came out, of course, and everybody read yeah. it. Everybody's still reading it, by the way. Sort of, yeah, yeah. But Does I feel like stop? there was a moment, yeah. you know, like the Twitter, there's a Twitter hashtag, you know, and it like trends and it feels like that day everybody's talking about it. And then, if, and then, and not, no blame. That's how I deal with the things that come to me on the internet, too. But it's a strange thing to be on the, the other side of that. Yeah. And the time yeah. of it does feel really different like that is one thing that was strange about it was that it felt like my timeline was really different than everybody else's timeline yeah yeah how does one because he said it's a beautiful thing of course it 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 changed something of it it made people think about something in real life i mean I think a lot of writers yeah. would think, wow, yeah. don't you dare to complain. Oh. <laughs> I mean, liter- literature can do something. No, I mean, a short totally, story totally. does it. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't, I don't think complain is, I mean, sometimes I complain, I'm human, I complain about everything, but like, um, but no, I, I'm proud of the work the story did. But I do think the more, you know, it's easy to sort of dismiss it or whatever and say it was just like a hashtag. But I feel like the truth is, that you're right, that people thought about that story really deeply and intensely, and they used it to talk about very complicated things about their own lives and like to have these conversations that were incredibly nuanced. And that's the thing that I feel like it takes me, you know, that I still can say, yeah, I'm still processing it. I'm still thinking about it. I'm still trying to understand what the story meant for people. But that fiction can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like, of course it can when you think about it, right? Like, That's what I use fiction for all the time is to understand my own life. I think it's crazy in some way just to have the snapshot of it, right? And to have everybody doing it kind of at once and out loud seems different, but... And also we also almost think all the time that it's just a few people in an attic. Yeah. But it was millions of people. It was. I mean, I think it's interesting and, well, it's interesting to think about, like, some people read it and it mattered deeply to them, you know, and they talked about it and they shared it and some people read it and they hated it, but they still thought deeply about it and shared it. And some people read it and were like, I hate the story, fuck it, you know, and shared it. And all of those shares get kind of like, they were all happening at the same time. And it's hard to like know necessarily what is behind each one of them. It was a timing, of course, also. It came out a few weeks after and testimonials about Weinstein behavior came yeah. out. And so it was right. In, it's like you've written an, an, an anthem for the Me Too movement. It's scary also, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I mean, I don't know if funny is the word, but I wrote that story, you know, months and months before it came out. So before um, it wasn't exactly before the Me Too movement started, but it was before it really like yeah. had reached a, a height I wrote in April of 2017. And so the way I think I think of it as like, of its time, and I think it was, do you know, like of that moment that Mm -hmm. felt so fraught and kind of difficult in the wake of the election, you know, when just conversations between men and women did feel just like everyone's teeth was on edge. I do think it grew out of that space, Um, but I certainly had no idea how, I couldn't have anticipated what would happen with it, and it astonished me, and like, yeah, it was like a little, it's overwhelming and it feels like a kind of responsibility that you don't necessarily know how to ad- adopt, especially when it's like overnight. Let's do something fictional. Mm-hmm. What if um, you knew then what you know now? Would you send it to the New York? Would you send it out? I would. I would. I wouldn't change anything. I I wouldn't. I'm so glad. The day the story got into the New Yorker was the happiest day of my life. Like, I will never... You were a writer. I was. And was I was that, like... Was that really a decisive yeah, moment? it really yeah. was. And, it, and, like, I'd had a couple of stories in some small places. But really, for me, you know, I, was, I had finished school. I was just sort of, like... I was counting, like... Month, it was like in months. I was like, okay, well, I can keep writing, afford to keep writing for like another month. I would win a prize and be like, okay, that's another six months, you know, and I'd be like mm-hmm. counting up. And when the story got into your car, I was like, oh, this might be something I'll be able to do for a really long time. And that was like, that was night and day. And then when the collection came out too, like even with the story just having been in the New Yorker, um, 
there's no guarantee you can sell a short story collection just on the strength of that. You know, it's likely, but you don't know. The market is really tough. Um, I think my agent and I were hopeful, but we didn't know. And so then to then be able to sell my collection and then have people read my story, of course I would do it again. I think I would have, I would be scared if I went back and told myself everything that happened. I'd be like, oh my God, that's so awful. And then I, future me in this story would have to be like, it's okay, don't worry, you you're do not, it anyway. You're not scared anymore. I am still scared. I think this, my life has changed really fast. And I think that for me these past year and a half, and I think anytime that things change as fast as they've changed for me, there's just a feeling of like, ah, stop the ride. I want to get off. Um, but I don't, I just, you know, I'm, I will be happy when the pace of change slows a little bit. You're scared, but are you scarred? Because that's in, in the book, There's a, it's just one yeah. letter. It's not, I didn't invent this. She did. Scarred. It's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's just one letter of difference. Yeah. But you're not scarred. I don't think so. I try hard not to be. I think, and I mean, who knows? I feel like there have been times when I've thought, like, when there's, like, a particularly ugly, like, online thing or whatever, where I start to feel really angry about or protective of the stories, and then I can feel myself kind of clenching around them. And I try hard to, like, not do that. Because I think that is where scars come from. It's just sort of feeling like, oh, I wanted everyone to understand what I meant, or it bothers me so much that this man did that. And I just, like, for me, of course, there are things that I'll carry with me, but I think it's worth it to just remember, like, I wanted all of this, I wouldn't trade it. And so like, you know. And you also probably learned to be, to be silent, just yeah, to wait. totally, totally. That was what I was really lucky after Cat Person. Um, the, I, my instinct was to hide. Like I was just not ready to go online and like engage, but I was, I had people give me good advice, which was like, let it go by, you know, you don't have to jump in. And I'm so glad that I did. I feel like the conversation went so much better than it would have if I'd been there trying to like guide it or control it. And even when people said things that were like upsetting or offensive or like felt even personal to me, I think they went away because I didn't engage as, and, and other people rose up to be sort of thoughtful and like argue about the story on its merits instead of me trying to be there and controlling it. And I'm really, really glad that I didn't. Yeah. Um, is there in any way like a, a feeling that um, the parameters of, of what happened, of, of the way you've written it and all, all that magical potion that you made there, uh -huh. <laughs> maybe it's black magic. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, like, let's fix this. Let's do this again. What do you mean? Yeah. Do you... Do you Is there a tendency to like um, feel, I want to write cat person again. I want to uh, have that impact again. I want, I want those special things to happen again. No, I mean, I don't know, maybe. I, right now, I feel like I got everything that I needed out of cat person in that I got a book contract and I got enough money to write. And that is what I have. And, if, and I'm grateful for that. But everything else, I can't explain. Like, I'm, gl I'm glad I went through it. I do not want to feel it again. That feeling of exposure was like astonishingly hard. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that I want people to read my stories. Yeah. And I, I think without the exposure, but the effect of writing something that engages so many people. Yeah. On I, an important topic. I do. But I I guess it's funny. It's like I never if you the question is, do you do I sit down and be like, how can I write another cat person? I don't. Yeah. And I think it's just like I also know I feel like many, many, many stories that don't go viral, touch people and yeah. like affect them. And I, and you don't even hear about it because mostly when people are reading fiction, they keep, they, you know, it's a quiet kind of personal experience. And, and to me, think. that is graspable in a way that the sort of virality just kind of isn't, it's just on a scale I can't wrap my mind around. And I think um, I also really believe deeply and like, I guess it's to my benefit, maybe other people disagree, but I don't think you can control that stuff. I don't think you can control what goes viral and what doesn't. I think of it as like a weather pattern, you know, and I think of cat person going viral as something that happened to me rather than something that I did. Ra even though I, I, I feel like I have some ownership of the story and, and how people responded to it. But the story did it. Yeah, exactly. I don't have control, so why would I try to do it again? People always say when, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very cliche question, you know, but when the first book 
for you, it was the first like story yeah. that went out. Uh, is 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 highly acclaimed and everybody's uh, enthusiastic. <gasps> the second book. Yeah. But maybe because it was a short story, it was easier to you know keep writing and and and, and bring it all together and and not be afraid to say this is also me. Uh huh. Well, sort of. I wish I could take credit for that much bravery. But actually, I had written most of the book before Cat Person went viral. That's a lucky thing. It was. It was very lucky. I don't know how I would have done it um, if you know if I'd had to write the whole thing from no, scratch. Because people would would want from you to have the same kind of right, stories. Exactly. Yeah. I would have. And it's quite different. It is really different. And, and I mean, that was disorienting in its own way, too, knowing that people had gotten to know me through a story that was in some ways kind Being of an typical. outlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I knew that I wanted this book to be my book, that I'm the kind of writer that I am. And, and I'm lucky that, like, my publishers and my editors of course. were willing to, yeah. to go there with me. But, yeah, it is. It's strange. It's just strange, I think with any scale to write publicly is different than when you're writing alone in your room and whether, you know, it's your first book. I think that move from the first book is always going to be yeah. disorienting. It was a huge move though. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll not talk about the stress of the novel uh -huh. uh, that yeah. has to come, uh -huh. but um, there's, there's these stories will, will appear on screen if everything goes well, right? Potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's funny, actually, I don't always, include this but I should um, Cat Person because it was published in the New Yorker they have a production company Condé Nast so they have optioned Cat Person for a feature film which I don't know if it will happen um, it's hard for me to imagine and yet who knows it could be magical um, so that may or may not happen and then um, but then HBO optioned the rest of the stories um, for two young-ish, my age, women writers um, who'd met on The Leftovers. And it's their project now, which I think sometimes people don't know. They think I'm like in mm. charge of it. No, it's out of my hands. Um, but I read a script, that they, two scripts that they wrote, and I'm biased, but I think they're brilliant. They're so <laughs> weird and like dark and ugh. But like oh, but then on the screen, there is appreciation yeah, for horror. Truly, yeah. truly. Um, and so they're just, you know, I don't really understand the whole process so they're just working on it and like we still many many more like executives have to green light it or whatever before it becomes reality but certainly yeah fingers crossed that would be another peak day if uh if that happens. you can hide yeah you can hide in true. brussels if that you I, this I, because it's not mine i feel less you know yeah. it's just exciting because i don't have to you know less itchy yeah exactly <laughs> thank you very much of course um we have a time like 10 minutes before uh mrs rupinian will go sign your books and you can buy the books of course like at every place where you are here at pasaporta if somebody has a question this is the time uh, you were warned that um, I was. They said Belgian audiences were very shy, shy so I think you should disprove that stereotype. Straight out questions. of Germany, so yeah. <laughs> prove prove them wrong or not. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, hi. Good evening. Hi. Um, I haven't read your collection yet, but the the, the first line that you that you that you read was. Um, very intriguing, <laughs> and it made me think of of of, um, of another writer. I think her name is um, Mary Gateskill. Totally. I don't know if you've read her work. Yeah. And so my question is the following: um, she she also writes sort of dark stories. Yeah. If if this story that that Ruth read had been written by a man. <laughs> Do you think it would be perceived in a different way? Almost certainly, yeah. I mean, it's hard to know that game of, like, hypotheticals. You know, like, what if this, what if that? I think that the freedom that I... It's totally possible that I have freedom to write despicable or, like, upsetting male characters as a woman that I wouldn't otherwise. I think that also it's interesting to think whether cat person would have been read really differently if it had been by a man, even though that's a female point of view. I think one of the things that this year has really taught me is that who people imagine you are as a writer plays a huge role in how they read your stories. Like before you start playing around with gender or anything, the fact that I was an unknown writer and that you couldn't tell the difference, that people thought maybe she's just like Margot, like really shaped their reading of the story. And so I think I have had to learn and I don't know what Mary Gateskill would say. I, I love Mary Gateskill. I, I, she is one of my favorite writers, although sometimes it scares me a little because 
she wrote also Bad Behavior, the short story collection that's very full of like very dark and kind of kinky sex in like 1981. And people, st and now she wrote like a beautiful novel about parenthood called The Mare, you should read it. But people are still like, oh, Mary Gates girl, she's the one who writes about kinky sex. And I feel that, like I get the way that that like can really be, a, it's, it's dramatic and it, and it catches your eye. And I, I think that, Anyway, but to answer, your, to answer your actual question, probably, and I don't think there's much we can do about it. I think everything that people think they know about me plays into how they read the stories. And you can say, oh, I wish it was otherwise. I wish that, you know, it was pure and we just took them stories as though they dropped from heaven. But the truth is that's not true. So they probably would. But thank you. Yeah, it's a thoughtful question. Um, there's another one. I think it's a question. Yeah. Um, this is a very simple question, but... Were you surprised how many people thought Cat Person was very recognizable? Because for me, that was, I read it, I thought, I mean, I didn't have anything just like it, but it sort of, I was like, I had no this feeling. And I felt like so many people on Twitter were like that. Did that surprise you at all? Yeah, I mean, totally it did. And it's funny, I've said before, and it is true, sort of the story itself is not autobiographical, but there are like the messy feelings that I put in there. I remember at one point, I swear this is true, writing a sentence, I won't tell you which one, and being like, I wonder if I'm the only person that ever felt that way. And so like to have the entire world like scream back, like, no, you are not, is a good feeling, but then also a bad feeling because they're bad feelings, you know? And so it's, it's strange to think, it's, it's part of that complicated processing of like, it's good that people share their bad feelings, but also what do you do? Like now that you've recognized them, the story is like, doesn't offer solutions. It doesn't say what to do differently. It's just a space to have people talk about them. Um, so yeah, I, I was grateful and surprised and also like kind of stunned by what it was like to have people identify with it as much as they did. Yeah. Thank you. No more questions? I'll let you go buy the book then downstairs and you will sign them. Yes, I, yes, I will. <laughs> Thank you for being so Thank you. Thank you.